Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. So today I'm making a rare on-camera appearance. Uh, I don't really like being on the camera, uh, and I figured nobody really wants to see my ugly mug. But uh, today's the day, so here I am. Today's project is to rebuild this little honey right here. This is a Continental F245 flathead industrial engine. And if you recall some of my earlier videos about the big ugly forklift project, this is actually the backup engine that I was going to install in that forklift. However, uh, that forklift has met its maker. Uh, it was just too far gone to, to do anything with that machine. Uh, however, this uh, backup engine that I, that I obtained is totally worth saving. So we're going to go ahead and rebuild it. And I thought I would just bring you guys along for the ride. So, uh, I'll give you a little bit of the history of this engine, and we'll talk about some of the some of the details here. So, this engine came out of another forklift identical to that Clark forklift that I had, and this engine had spun a main. And so, when it comes to engines, you know, it's like any other trade; they have kind of their own language, and so there's all these these terms that we throw around when an engine fails you know it threw a rod or it spun a main or it spun a rod or you know whatever so what it means when the engine spun a main is uh, these are the main bores right here that's where your crankshaft uh, basically resides so the crankshaft rotates in this bore and there's a shell bearing looks like this this is actually a rod bearing but it's the same idea so there's a pair of these shell bearings. I think the other one's over here somewhere. Yeah, so there's a pair of these shell bearings like this. They fit together as a set like this. And then they fit inside this bore and they're squeezed by this cap. And I'll try to show you. There's a little tab right here on each shell bearing. They both have a tab. And when the shell bearing is installed, uh, you want both of the tabs on the same side, just like so. And then there's actually a corresponding notch in the main bearing cap and the main bearing bore for that little tab to reside. And the, the shell bearing is squeezed by the cap, and then it also has this little tab, and that's supposed to keep the bearing from spinning. So what happens when a bearing, quote, spins a main or spins a rod, is that this bearing actually basically welds itself to the crankshaft and then it starts to spin inside of this bore instead of the crankshaft spinning inside of the bearing. So this is a piece of the damaged main bearing that came out of this engine and basically if the if the engine spins a main you're gonna have damage to the crankshaft and the block if it spins a rod you're gonna have damage to the rod connecting rod and the crankshaft and you know however bad that damage is determines how much work you have to do to fix it so in the case of this engine right here we had to line bore the block so the process for that they take these caps off and they'll grind the bottom part of the cap here to move it closer to the block and then they'll go through and line bore all these journals and Typically in an engine, because the piston is pushing down, if the, if the main bearing is damaged, it's going to be damaged predominantly on the cap. So usually they can just remachine the cap, just, just lightly dust the block side, and everything will be okay. Now in some cases of severe damage, they had to go in and you know basically spray weld the bores, build everything back up and it can be very very costly like to the point where it may not even be worth salvaging the block this one wasn't too bad I had a spare main cap off of the other engine so we used that cap and uh, of course they had to be matched together the, the caps are doweled so they had to be uh, fitted together but uh, we were able to save this one it wasn't a big deal okay so the other half of the damage is going to be in the crankshaft and if the crankshaft has enough stock you can just grind the crankshaft down and it's not a big deal typically you can grind a crankshaft up to thirty thousandths without any any real hazard uh, 
Uh, if the damage is too bad, they can weld the crankshaft. Uh, I've had that done successfully before. It's really not a big deal. A good automotive machine shop can weld and uh, straighten and grind a crankshaft. Uh, the thing about welding a crankshaft though is that all the journals have to be ground after it's been welded. So, you know, if you had damage to a rod journal and they were just grinding it, all they have to do is grind the rod journals. It's not a big deal. But if you have to weld it, all the mains and rods had to be ground together because they basically distort the crankshaft when they weld it and they will straighten it but they can't get it straight enough they have to grind it uh, so that can be kind of a costly process uh, but the biggest thing is it just takes a lot of time there's not a lot of places anymore that can grind crankshafts and uh, you know I've waited three or four months before to have crankshafts repaired uh, so it's one of those things if you can source a used crankshaft sometimes that's a better idea there are a lot of aftermarket crankshafts now being made in India and China. Uh, I don't know how good the quality is, but uh, you know you can you can roll the dice if you if you choose to. But welding and grinding crankshafts is a totally valid repair. Uh, so the other things that I've had the machine shop do for me, they bored out the cylinder bores here to 40 thousandths oversize. On this particular motor, there are a lot of oversize piston options. 10 thousandths, 20 thousandths, 30 thousandths, 40 thousandths, and there's a Hail Mary 60 thousandths that you can throw at it. So this engine does not use sleeves. If the, if the engine does use sleeves, uh, dry or wet sleeves, typically you can just remove the sleeves, install new sleeves, and then go back to the nominal piston diameter. But in this case, we have to bore it, and I will tell you that on these Continentals, they can actually sleeve them. So if you bore it beyond 60 thousandths, they can sleeve it. And typically what they do with the 245s is they'll sleeve it down to a 227. So the 227 is the exact same engine, except that it has a smaller bore. So they'll just make a custom sleeve, well, six custom sleeves in this case, install them, and then bore it for 227 pistons. But we don't have to do that in this case. We're still uh, you know, well within the acceptable range at 40 thousandths. So I have oversized pistons and we'll just go with that. Uh, the other thing that I had them do, which is fairly important, this engine was, was washed in a caustic solution. And it's kind of like a big, a big hot bath. And it takes off all the grime, but more importantly it cleans out all the metal that was generated when the, when the main bearing spun. You know, it basically just eats itself apart. So all that metal distributes itself throughout all the oil passages and it's really hard to clean that without you know some kind of really aggressive process so I had the the uh, engine block dipped and in the caustic solution and as a result of that basically everything has to be removed from the engine all the core plugs have to be removed and then it will also eat the cam bearings so the cam bearings were not bad but they had to be replaced after they've been through that solution because the caustic solution will eat the Babbitt material. So I've gone ahead and installed new cam bearings and I've just installed the valve guides and ground the valve seats so we'll take it from there. Okay so I guess we'll see how it goes with this video. It's probably going to be a series of videos. Uh, there's too much content to jam it into one video. It takes quite a while to put an engine back together. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous about making an engine rebuild video just because it's so controversial. You know, everyone's an expert. Uh, I will tell you that I'm not an expert. I don't have any formal training or factory training or anything like that. Everything I know about rebuilding engines I learned from my dad or from a, a, the truck repair shop that I used to work in. And, you know, I just do it the way that they did it because it worked for them. I've seen my dad rebuild countless engines and, you know, he's never had one come apart. So that's good enough for me. Uh, so if I say things like, uh, you know, definitively, like like it sounds like I'm an authority, I'm not an authority. I'm just telling you what, what I know works for me. If you have a different idea, uh, you know, be my guest. All right, this is the top side of the engine block, and this is a flathead engine, or what Continental calls an L-head engine. And that basically means that the valves are in the actual block. It's not an overhead valve engine, which is what we're used to today. This is really old school technology. The design of this engine goes back well into the 1930s and they really didn't change them. 
but this is very simple and very reliable. So for all intents and purposes you can think of this engine as six little single cylinder Briggs & Stratton engines all stacked up in a row. So according to the rebuild manual for this engine there's a distance spec from the top of the valve guide to the top of the block and it's an inch and 15 30 seconds. So I'm just using this little protractor right here. I've got it set to the depth that I want and then I just stick it on the top of the block and basically install the valve guide until until you know I reach the depth that I want. And I'm driving these valve guides in manually. I'm just using a piloted tool like this, just a piece of mild steel and I turn this pilot and then uh, I'm just hitting them in with a hammer. So you can drive them in from the top or the bottom, doesn't really matter. So if you go too far, you can always go back. So the tool just sticks in there and then uh, drive the guide in. So normally I would press the valve guides in, but the engine block's too heavy to set up in my press. So I'm just pounding them in. They do make a version of these tools for an air hammer. And I have one, I just don't have the right size. But that's a lot faster and easier. So on a lot of overhead valve engines, the valve guide actually fits into a counterbore. And the depth is set by the depth of the counterbore. You don't have to measure it. But in this case, there actually is a measurement and you have to drive the, the valve guide in to the right depth. And I have seen some engines, especially Subarus, where these valve guides like to move around. Now if you're ever working on a late model Subaru, you definitely have to check the valve guide depth whenever you remove the heads because they have a tendency to sink, you know, sink down. And those are overhead valve engines and if the valve guide sinks too much, it's going to push the valve down until you have contact with the piston. So it can be a, a, a hand grenade waiting to go off. With the valve guides installed, the next step is to grind or machine the valve seats. So I've already done it in this case, but I'll walk you through the process. So the small one here is the exhaust. It's a 45 degree valve and it has a hardened valve seat insert. The larger one here is the intake. It's 30 degrees and it is not hardened. So if you're going to run unleaded gas, propane or especially diesel, it's really important to have a hard valve seat, at least on the exhaust valve. Most engines today have it on both intake and exhaust, but in the old days, these would have both been soft, you know, back in the old days of leaded gas, and they could get away with it, but the modern fuels are a lot harsher, so it's important to have at least the exhaust side be a hardened valve seat. So the process for this one is pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, I just use a, a valve grinder for the exhaust side, grind my 45 degree, and then uh, the most important thing on this engine, you cannot do a three angle valve job on this engine because there is no third angle. The valve seats go basically vertical. So we really only have to worry about the, the ceiling angle and then the clearance angle at the top. So if you see the valve here, basically what we want is the edge of this ceiling surface, or I guess it's this one, this ceiling surface to stop just short of the edge of the valve. We don't want the valve to sit down inside of the valve seat too far because it, it won't clean. That's the primary reason for narrowing the valve seats is to keep the carbon off the valves. So it's pretty simple. Grind the main. Uh, ceiling surface and then narrow the valves with the next angle stone. The intake side is a little tricky on this one because the, the valves are actually angled slightly towards the pistons. So what I did is used a, a three angle form carbide form tool to actually cut this valve seat and then I just touched it with the, the grinder and then I always lap my valves just to make sure that I have good contact but everything there is ready to go. The next step after the valve guides and seats is to install the lifters. This is one of them right here. So this is what's called a flat tappet engine. And that means that these, this tappet surface here on the bottom of the lifter actually just rides right against the cam. So it slides down in this bore, the cam is here, and it actually just has a hard, very hard ground surface here that slides on the camshaft lobe. And usually they, they also rotate slightly in their bore as the cam rotates. Uh, 
and you get kind of a of a circular wear pattern on the bottom of the tappet. Now most of the newer engines, especially diesel engines, are going to have roller lifters, meaning that they actually have a roller bearing on the bottom, so the 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 lifter doesn't rotate; it's it's fixed, and then the roller bearing rides against the cam, so you have a lot less friction. Now these lifters came out of came out of this block so I think it's a good idea to put the same lifters back in the block that it originally had typically I like to put the lifters back into the same bore they came out of you know I keep track of where they came from and put them back in the same spot in this case I didn't take this engine apart and they were all just thrown in a box so I don't have that luxury but we do need to inspect them mostly we're looking at this tappet surface so you see this one here it just has a little bit of a of a round circular pattern on it that's totally fine this one right here came out of the other engine see how it's actually pitted and worn through the case hard layer you don't want to install this into the engine now you can resurface the bottom of these tappets as long as you don't go through the case hard layer uh, but we don't have to worry about that we got plenty of tappets that are good so I'm gonna go ahead and install these lifters I just like to put a little bit of engine oil on them before I slide them in and they had to come in from the bottom. There's not room to slip them in from the top. Uh, and because of that, you have to put the lifters in before you put the cam in. And these are what are called solid lifters, meaning that they have a valve adjuster screw, as opposed to what we see now, which is most engines have hydraulic lifters. And in a hydraulic lifter, the valve lash is automatically compensated for by oil pressure. This is old school. You had to adjust the valves. I'm ready to install the camshaft. I just wanted to double check on these cam bearings to make sure that the hole in the bearing is aligned with the oil passage that goes through the block. Okay, here we go. I never use assembly lube. Uh, I guess if you were if you were installing a new cam that had to be broken in, it might be a good idea. But uh, I always just use engine oil. That's it. So the, the cam bearings are stepped, meaning that the largest diameter is towards the front of the engine. So it's actually not too hard to install. Well, I found a problem. I was getting ready to install the valve springs, and you got to pop them over the end of these valve guides. And I noticed that one of the brand new valve guides that I installed is cracked. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. You see this crack right here in the neck down part of the valve guide? This one's actually cracked in several places so I don't know if it was like that from the get-go or if I did that when I installed it uh, I probably did that when I installed it I just wasn't careful enough and this one here is cracked as well it's harder to see but uh, yeah there it is definitely is cracked so I don't see a problem with the other 10 just these two happen to be cracked so I took the cam back out, took the lifters out, and uh, I've ordered two new valve guides. And hopefully they'll be here tomorrow and we'll get them installed. These are the wrist pin bushings in the connecting rods. We're going to reuse the connecting rods, but these bushings had to be replaced. They're a press fit, so they have to be pressed out, a new bushing has to be pressed in, and then they have to be bored or honed to size. And these are really thin wall bushings, extremely thin wall bushings, and they can be a little bit tricky to deal with. So I'll show you how, how I do it. So what I do is I take one of the old wrist pins. Uh, we're not going to reuse the wrist pins. The new pistons will come with new pins. And I just put a bead of weld around it, you know, yay far from the end, and then chuck it up in the lathe and turn the weld bead down to a shoulder, and then turn the outside of the weld bead down to 
so that it will pass through the, the top of the connecting rod and then you have yourself a nice piloted tool to press the old bushings out and press the new bushings in. You got to be careful it's very easy to screw these bushings up when you press them in so if you don't want to mess with this just take it to your machine shop and have them press them in uh, but I have uh, my own rod pin hone so I can do that part of it myself. I guess I can show you how I press one of them out so that's just an old socket I don't know 15 16 it's just a place for the bushing to go and this is just an arbor press that's it so installing the new bushing is pretty straightforward just need to make sure that you have the oil hole lined up with the oil hole in the the connecting rod and push her in there and then the bushings are slightly longer than the actual width of the rod so you kind of just center them up like so. I've got the connecting rod set up in my vise and I'm gonna check the bore diameter so I went ahead and torqued the torqued the studs down to 45 foot-pounds that's the spec and then the bore diameter spec is between 2.1865 and 2.187 so I set my dial bore gauge for 2.187 and it's right on the money so basically making sure that the bore is actually round measuring this this dimension right here can confirm that the bore hasn't been stretched so I feel pretty confident moving forward now if you find out that the bore is out of spec or is is oval in shape you can have your machine shop grind the bottom of the cap, move it down, and then rebore the the crank journal. Unless you have a fractured rod, you know, like in a Cummins or something, and then you're pretty much screwed. You got to buy a different rod. Unless there's an oversized outside diameter bearing available. I'm just checking the ring gap real quick. The spec is 8 to 18 thousandths. So yeah, we're good. And I'm not going to check all the rings. I'm just going to check one set in one bore. I know the bores are all the same within a few tenths. So I don't think it's necessary to check all the rings. But I do want to confirm at least one set. Just to make sure we don't have something, something way out of whack. I'm going to go ahead and install the piston rings a three-piece oil ring so the spacer or they call it the expander goes on first and then the book says put the gap between the pin bores So there's the oil ring. We got a gap here at the pin, a gap here at the pin, and then the gap in the expander is right here. And the big thing with the expander is you just got to make sure that it's that it's just butted up against itself and not overlapped or or something crazy like that. And then the other rings are a little easier. Uh, the only thing about these rings, they are tapered, and they have marked the top of the piston ring, I don't know if you can see it, there's a little divot right there that goes to the top. 
and then the top one I don't believe it's tapered uh, but it does still have a little mark so we'll put that at the top okay it's a few days later and I've got my replacement valve guides installed and I'm just going through and putting in the valve springs and I got the, the cam reinstalled and I did buy some assembly lube and I did use it on the cam so now I don't have to incur the you know the wrath of the internet so I'm going through and sticking these valve springs in the valve springs are the same on the intake and the exhaust and it's kind of a pain in the pain in the behind to put these in so what I've been doing is just sticking the springs and they fit down in a little counter bore and then once the springs are set in that counter bore then you can install the the keepers on the ends exhaust valves take these rotators and then the intake valves are just static and again the rotators are just designed to to slightly rotate the valve and that prevents carbon buildup on the exhaust valve So I like to put a little oil on the rotators, make sure that they're free. And then we can install them. It's kind of a pain. So what you got to do is bend the spring back up, stick the little rotator in there, and then I just take a little bar. situated okay take the bar like so well the intake ones are a little easier okay so I'll put a little bit of oil on each valve stem. Doesn't really matter. Next I need to install the valve keepers or collets. These little guys here. So they're just like a wedge that holds the, the valve to the spring and I just need to rotate the cam until the lifters are all the way down so you see I can do the back three cylinders and then I'll have to rotate the cam before I can do uh, number two and number three. You need a valve spring compressor this is the one that I use uh, it's made by Craftsman or it's sold by Craftsman I don't know who actually makes it but it works pretty well there is a different style you can use for these flathead motors where it actually spreads inside so it spreads from the lifter to the valve and those are used a lot on small engines and they work really well I just I don't have that style I don't work on a lot of flathead motors okay and then I like to put a little bit of grease on the inside of the keepers And the grease is just to hold them in place. And then make sure you get the, the fat side towards the bottom. Like so. There we go. I think we're ready to install the crankshaft next. I've got new main bearings here. These are 10 thousandths undersize main bearings. The crankshaft we're going to use came from a different engine. It's a, you know out of the other block. And it had been ground once before. So it's 10 thousandths undersize on the journals for the rods and the mains and I mic'd all the journals, everything's in spec, 
and the finish looks good so there's no reason to regrind the crankshaft we're just going to go ahead and install these undersized bearings and, and drop the crank in. So the most important thing about installing main bearings is to make sure you get the holes lined up with the oil passages in the block. And what I usually do is just try to feel that I have the bearing centered in the in the half of the bore. You know, just feel that you have a, an equal amount sticking up on either side. This engine's a little weird. The, the tab right here, normally the, the tab's on the same side in the block and the cap. For whatever reason on this engine, the, the tabs are on opposite sides. So, who knows? No rhyme or reason to any of this stuff. This bearing right here is the one that spun. And you can see what a terrible design this is. It's got an extra hole here. And then this large hole right here is for the oil pump to pass through. But they actually chopped out part of the part of the actual bore for the the main bearing. So yeah, that's a that's a pretty crappy design. It's you know it's missing whatever percentage of its contact area there. And I looked at the other block that still has the old mains in it, and there's no hole in the bearing for this this passage right here. I don't know if it was just for I don't know what it's for, but it does not does not have a passageway through the bearing. So I'm not going to worry about it. And then the, the last one back here takes this thrust style bearing right here that has two shoulders on it. So there's no thrust load in this application, but if you had a, a manual transmission with a clutch and a, and a throw out bearing, that's what the thrust bearing is for. On this particular engine, there's an oil passage hole in both halves of the bearing. And I don't know why all engines aren't built that way, but a lot of times they're not. A lot of times the lower bearing is solid and you got to be really careful about that. My brother just rebuilt an International DT-466 and it had just been rebuilt by another shop and he said that they rolled a bearing in that was solid on the top side of the main and it ran for I don't know about an hour like that and then it spun a main bearing and completely destroyed the engine. I've got the crank sitting up here on the block and it's just sitting in the bearings dry I'm going to go ahead and check the clearance on the main bearings using some plastic gauge. So this is one to three thousandths clearance plastic gauge. What we're looking for is a thou and a half clearance on the main bearings. And uh, if you've never used this stuff before, all it is is a little strip of clay. And you set it on the bearing here, torque your cap down, and then it'll actually deform the clay. And then you can measure it using this scale here, and it'll tell you what the clearance is. And it's not always necessary. You know, if this was a, a virgin crank that had never been ground before, probably wouldn't even bother. But because it's been ground and it's been line honed, even though I've measured everything, I still want to double check. See it? That's it right there. That, that little green line, that's the plastic gauge. And you got to make sure that you get it on one side or the other of the oil groove in the middle of the bearing. The most important thing with the plastic gauge is make sure you do not rotate the crankshaft. If you spin the crank in the journals, you're going to smear that clay and you'll have to start all over. I hope you guys can see this mark right here on the camera. That's what's left of our clay, the plastic gauge clay, after it's been deformed. And the package comes with a scale. So all we do is just line up the scale with the width of that mark and that will tell us what clearance we actually have between the bearing and the crankshaft and you can see it's spot on at one and a half thousandths so the desired clearance for this engine is one and a half thousandths but you are allowed anywhere between seven tenths and 
two and eight tenths. But you can see we're, we're right on the money. And I checked all four journals. All four journals are the same. So this crank is perfect. I'm going to clean this clay off real good. We'll pull the crank back out, lube everything up, set it back in for the last time, and torque the caps down. Man, I don't know about this assembly lube stuff. It's like rubbing a bunch of snot on it. I guess. I don't want to incur the wrath of the internet. I'm just checking the end play of the crankshaft real quick. So you see I got about four thousandths. The spec is two to six thousandths. So yeah, once again we're, we're right on the money. The wrist pin bushings on the connecting rods have been sized. I just used a hone. I'm not going to show the process because, you know, how many people have a hone? Just take it to your machine shop and, and they'll fix you up. So the spec is three to five tenths clearance on the wrist pin. And we actually size these to the pin because the pins are slightly smaller than the spec that's listed in the manual. So you don't want to just go off the, uh, the dimension that's given in the manual. You want to actually fit it. And that's not unusual from my experience. These pistons are not directional, so they can go in either way. There's going to be some background noise. It's the first day in five months that it's been nice enough to open the doors, so you're going to have to listen to the neighbors rattle the old power stroke. Now, as I was saying, the pistons are not directional, but the connecting rods are. So you're looking down the bore of the number one piston, and you see how the crank journal is actually offset slightly towards the rear. If you look at the connecting rod, it's also offset slightly to one direction. So we have to make sure that we get the piston in you know, this way so that it lines up with the crank journal. So lots of oil in the piston rings. But be very careful, these rings are super sharp and you can easily cut yourself. So now that we got some oil in there, we need to make sure that we have our, our ring gaps spaced out evenly around the piston. Okay, we got one, two, three. Looks pretty good. Rod bearings installed, so we'll go ahead and drop it in. We're going to try this 
fancy ring compressor first and if it doesn't work we'll go back to the old one. Well, that didn't work very well. Same thing on the rod journals. I'm checking the clearance with some plastic gauge. So I've gone ahead and squeezed it down. And we're shooting for a thou and a half clearance again, just like on the mains. And you can see we're, we're spot on. So I'm only gonna check number one and six. I've mic'd all the journals on the crank and they're all within a few tenths and we've already checked the the rod bores we know they're all within a few tenths so there's no reason to repeat this step but I did want to confirm it on at least one cylinder just to make sure everything was cool so I'll get this plastic gauge cleaned off we'll put some of the assembly lube on I'll torque it down and then I'll go ahead and install all six of the uh, of the pistons I hit a roadblock with the rod bearings so the rebuild kit that I purchased came with three sets of left hand and three sets of right hand bearings, meaning that the tabs on the left or the right hand side. And it turns out that all my rods are the same. They all are right hand. So three of my rod bearing sets are wrong. And I called Reliance to get three more sets of the correct bearings. And they told me it would be at least 30 days before they had them in stock. So obviously that's kind of an issue. I went ahead and searched eBay and found four sets of NOS bearings. Uh, they're all made by Clevite, so pretty sure they're the only supplier. And they're all basically interchangeable. Uh, the problem is these are 10,000 center size. They had every other size available except for the 10,000s. So anyway, I bought some NOS bearings from, from eBay, and hopefully they'll be here, I don't know, three, four days, something like that. And then I also had bought a complete expansion or core plug kit and it was short one plug so I picked up another one locally it's an inch and five eighths plug and I'll go ahead and install that real quick this is my favorite libation here <laughs> 